Welcome once again to Lato's Law. Here's Steve Lato. Civil asset forfeiture is a popular topic on YouTube and on this channel. That's the notion that you encounter law enforcement and they notice that you've got money or something of value on you. And they say, you know something, we think that's the product or fruit of a crime. We're going to take it from you. And if you want it back, sue us for it. But you've got to prove that it's not. And it reverses the uh, burden of proof and it's, it's a nightmare for some people. And it often costs more to get your money back than what your money's worth. So people go, it's not even worth doing. So they, they just walk away from it. And that, of course, would make sense that the smaller the asset forfeiture, the less likely it is that somebody will come back after it. So believe it or not, in some places, the police start targeting smaller amounts of money. So they encounter a motorist who's got mm, $2,000 in cash on him. They go, oh, you got that money on you. We think you're a drug dealer. And they, t- they take your money. Now, are you going to hire an attorney and go to court and sue to get your $2,000 back? Well, I've got news for you. An attorney is going to tell you, you cannot do that economically. It is not feasible. It will cost you more than the money is worth. So Minnesota is coming around on this one, my friends, and they recognize that exact issue. Changes to Minnesota's civil asset forfeiture laws passed the legislature in Minnesota. Stephen Montemayor wrote it for Star Tribune. A set of changes to the civil asset forfeiture laws in Minnesota have been in the making for two years now, and they appear to be on the verge of becoming law. Civil forfeitures worth less than $1,500 will end, except in specific drug cases where authorities can establish a direct link to criminal activity. The state is also broadening its data collection to study how the seized proceeds are used by law enforcement organizations and local governments. Uh, The new laws mark a victory for the state auditor, who made reshaping Minnesota's asset forfeiture laws an early priority of her first term. Her office discovered, while conducting a study of forfeitures carried out in 2019, that the average forfeiture under $1,500 was $473. bucks. 473 So you're driving along and you got $473 on you. And they take it from you. That just makes you an average person for a seizure under $1,500. That means there were some people below $473. So you got 200 bucks on you. You must be a criminal. She also found that forfeitures meeting that criteria added up to a tiny fraction of the $1.7 billion in local government spending on police and sheriff's services that year. So she's pointing out, look, we stopped this. It's not going to like ruin us financially. Because there are police departments who said, if we can't do civil asset forfeiture, we can't afford to operate. Um, that led her to conclude that ending smaller asset forfeiture could be a measure with a major effect on individual Minnesotans without rocking the system. The idea of getting rid of the instruments of crime, that's fair. She said, I think we can all agree that's reasonable, but I think that you could argue that I don't know if that $473 is really going to stop that drug ring, but it may cause homelessness or childlessness, and that's pretty extreme. Now, a veteran political strategist named Charles Anderson helped organize a coalition of advocates, law enforcement, and county prosecutors to study this issue, and at one point brought in a mediator to help broker a compromise on these legislative proposals. So there were people in Minnesota lobbying against this, saying, no, no, we got to keep allowing the forfeitures, even the ones that average $473. Uh, Anderson said the group struck an agreement on what to propose back in February of last year, but the pandemic slowed the progress and trying to get those reforms passed. So uh, they ultimately passed it this year, and the laws take effect January 1st. Uh, Anderson said, we've done smaller reforms in forfeiture, but I think this is a really, in a long time, the first major reform that's passed the legislature. It's good to see that, and we'll see how the law is implemented, how big of an impact it will have. Uh, they also include new policies around vehicle forfeitures, such as no longer seizing vehicles from defendants, who failed to appear in court. So apparently, in Minnesota, if you didn't appear in court in the old days, they might seize your vehicle. That'll teach you. Drivers can also have vehicle forfeiture proceedings halted in certain impaired driving cases by participating in an ignition interlock program and being accepted into a treatment court. So a lot of states have got that also. So if you get arrested for drunk driving, uh, many states will give you a restricted license back But they're leery of doing that because even if it says you can only drive to and from here, to and from here, to and from here, some people will go out and drive, and if they get pulled over, they go, oh, yeah, I'm going to uh, my AA meeting on a Saturday night at 11.55. (laughs) That's a late-night meeting, Your Honor. 
So um, they say, then, what, you know, how, how can we? So one thing to do is to put the ignition interlock that requires somebody to actually blow into it and, and have the correct levels uh, in their alcohol situation in their bloodstream to make that work, uh, but also into a treatment court. And uh, treatment court is often just uh, a program run by the court where they'll actually say, as part of your probation or whatever it is that you're on, that you don't just report to the court, but you've actually got to go do treatment or you've got to meet with counselors and you've got to follow their instructions and do what they say and get progress reports from them. And then the court will say that, you know, for you to basically get out of the court supervision, you've got to do what they tell you to do. And we'll take that into account when we decide what, you know, needs to be done with you. Uh, Most people recognize that if you simply punish people who drink and drive or run afoul of, of other laws involving controlled substances, simply punishing people does not necessarily always solve the problem. In fact, it often doesn't solve the problem. So many of these people need treatment. They need help. Many of them wouldn't seek it until they got pushed. Some people were in such denial they didn't know they needed help. And by the way, there'll still be some people who've been in court eight, nine, ten times, and they'll say, yeah, I'll go through this program. And at the end of the program, the counselor is going to come into court and say, your honor, it didn't help. This person here refuses to cooperate with us. They won't stop drinking, whatever it might be. So that happens. But I, I'm a firm believer that by making these services available, it does help. But let's get back to civil asset forfeiture. The Office of the Legislative Auditor will issue its own report on the efficacy of the changes in the coming years. The um, auditor said she also looks forward to further review of the new requirements to help settle best practices in the area of asset forfeiture, just as her office's report in 2019 helped affirm her position on forfeitures under 1500 bucks. Looking ahead, she added that she would like to consider expanding data collection to study demographic trends in asset forfeiture to determine whether any racial disparities are present. So this doesn't solve the problem, and this is actually just a very, very minor little tweak to the situation. But I remember not so long ago the Michigan State Police tweeting out a photograph of a couple bundles of money, and it was... I believe in the thousands of dollars that they had seized from a motorist. And they actually tweeted it, said, look what we seized. We seized this money from a motorist today. They were bragging about it. And I remember the time looking at that, and I think I I may have even retweeted the photograph with a comment saying, it's kind of like when your dog brings in something from outside proudly and drops it on the floor in front of you and says, look what I found. Almost never is that a good thing. Now, if you're out hunting and, and, and the dog retrieves something it's supposed to retrieve and drops it at your feet, yeah, good dog. But when the dog drags something to the house and puts it at your feet, or a cat, and goes, look what I found, that's what I kind of thought of when I saw that state police tweet bragging about the money they took from a motorist. And in the photograph, they made no mention of what the motorist had done. It actually mentioned, I believe, a traffic stop. So they traffic stopped somebody, found they had cash on them, and took it, photographed it, and tweeted it. Look what we found. Woo! And, and what? <laughs> you understand that if you simply stop cars randomly and search wallets and purses, you'll find money. But this isn't a treasure hunt where you get to keep what you find. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. It is if you're a cop. And that's, that's the problem. So it's interesting that they point out how many of these seizures are small amounts of money. Because nobody in their right mind is going to file an action to get 473 bucks back. Because you, you can't do it, like I said, economically. It's going to cost you more than that to hire an attorney. And I know people say, Steve, I'd, I'd handle it myself. You could, but you're going to spend more than 473 bucks of your own time doing it, and you're going to lose. Because the other side has you know all kinds of attorneys. The state's got them, the county's got them, the city, the municipality's got them. And they're going to run you ragged. It's not small claims court. This is going to be a court where there's going to be a judge saying, you know, are you prepared? What have you done? You know, you know. so no streamlined process here. So you wind up going to court like six times. And, and, and again, you've got to prove that the money is not the fruit of a crime versus them saying, well, we think it is. And again, it's, it's wrong on every level. So it's, it's good that the $1,500 and below limit is now going to be on the books in Minnesota. What about about 1500 bucks? You know, what about it? So 
they really need to change the laws to say, if they seize the money, there must be a criminal action filed within a certain amount of time or the money's got to go back. That, that, that's, that's a no-brainer. Because if they can't file a criminal action, then there must not have been a crime. If they think there was a crime, file a criminal action. That's what you do if you're law enforcement, right? And then if you file the action and the money's been seized, the money should be segregated and put aside and held by the court until the outcome of that criminal case. And during that criminal case, the court should then determine by the same standards, your innocence and guilt, whether or not the money was part of a criminal activity. By the way, if you're found not guilty, it should be just given back to you. If you're found guilty, then they should say, okay, and was the money, in essence, as guilty as the person? Was the money involved in this somehow? That's what it should be in all 50 states and at the federal level. It's not that way right now. So small steps are good, but they're not enough. But this is pretty cool, I guess. Kyle and Wade sent it. Uh, Stephen Monomayer wrote it for a Star Tribune. Changes to Minnesota civil asset forfeiture laws do pass the legislature and should become law shortly. Questions or comments, put them below. Let's talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching Lato's Law. A thing of beauty is a joy forever.